Discipleship Journey, Part 19. And part of this is the title is called The Kingdom Dividing Line. As, of course, we read in the uh, sermon scripture reading in Matthew 13 about the uh, parable of the tares and the wheat. I don't know why this thing's making noise, but we'll deal with it. But as an entry to this thing in the sermon text, we'll be in as Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. Now, there was a certain man who purchased a, a newspaper at a newspaper stand, and he greeted the person who sells the newspaper man very courteously, but every time in return, the seller of the newspapers always was kind of uh, angry and discourteous in his service and replied that way. But he accepted the newspaper, which was you know, rudely shoved in his face, and of course the customer probably smiled and wished the newsman a very nice weekend. And of course, the, uh, uh, a person, a friend of his, observed all this and asked, does he always treat you so rudely? And then he said, yes, unfortunately he does. And you are always so polite and friendly to him. And he said, yes, I am. And so he said, well, why are you so nice to him when he is so rude to you? He said, because I don't want him to decide how I am going to act. And that's so true. In today's world, we have... Evil, we have good, light, darkness. People can have an attitude. You can sell in a newspaper, be just uh, disgruntled or not very happy when it comes to, to their life or whatever it may be. And, but that doesn't just give us the right to turn evil for evil or to be bad if someone's bad to you. you know, the Lord of God says, vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. In this kingdom of God, which is something we've been looking at in our Wednesday Bible studies, which of course we will not have one this coming Wednesday, but our Wednesday Bible studies is an important aspect and we're talking about the kingdom of God. Throughout the word of God, Jesus, and throughout the parables, Jesus often used reference to the kingdom of heaven. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is like... And Jesus started many of his parables this way, and he spoke of some issues, some spiritual issues, but in an earthly, physical sense. And for those who had an ear to hear, they would hear and respond, if they were truly drawn by the Lord God, into his kingdom realm, in his domain. And we talked about the kingdom a lot in previous teachings and Wednesday Bible studies about his domain, the dominion that God has. And we know through the Bible study that the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. It's something beyond this world. It's something that is a spiritual kingdom that God came down and presented himself physically and he was teaching and telling others and warning about the kingdom of God and presenting the kingdom of God. And he used the parables in various ways to teach the multitudes. But again, for those who have an ear, let him hear, as he said in the last verse of verse 43, those who have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, as the Apostle John wrote in the book of Revelation in the last days we're living in. And we look around us today, we see the world, there's so much evil, there's so many things that are happening that we think, my God, can this even be, can we even imagine the fact that we can't even decide which gender you are, which sex you are, and go to the right bathroom? Or about, you know, same-sex marriage, or homosexuality, or evil, or corruption, or lies, or a standard of truth that has been stepped upon, in essence, the Word of God. And so we have to look beyond what the world is trying to say in this kingdom. And there is a dividing line when it comes to a walk of faith, dying to ourselves and coming alive in Christ. And in our scripture this morning, in our text, Jesus expounds upon the parable of the tears explained. And it's starting in verse 36. This is God's word in Matthew chapter 13. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. They will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, but then the righteousness will shine 
The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Father, let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, as we come to you, Lord. It's our kingdom, heavenly father, who has come down through his son Jesus in flesh, in carnality, that he would share and experience what it was like to be fully human. But yet in the divine side, he showed us and reveals us the spiritual kingdom of God. And Father, this morning, use me to speak as an oracle of God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. What is a parable? A parable is a short moral story that was often expressed with imagery and metaphor. And Jesus spoke in parables more specifically in regards to the kingdom of God, his kingdom. A kingdom that shall reign forever and ever, as we learned last Wednesday's Bible study. A kingdom that was illustrated in the Old Testament through the different kings that they had. And then they had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom that was divided, of course, later. But they had earthly kings. And they were looking, the Jewish people were looking for a true king to bring dominance again, especially during the time of the Roman Empire. But that wasn't the king that Jesus came as in the first time. He came as a spiritual kingdom, bringing shown that the need of love, tolerance, and the love of God, and the love of that was we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to abide in him through spiritual meaning and spiritual definition, and spiritual principles of the kingdom of God. Today, we do have the anticipation, the awaiting hope that, that Jesus Christ will soon come to restore his wonderful kingdom. But as for now, we have in this dispensation of grace, a grace that says you're saved by this wonderful grace of God. And we have been entered spiritually into this kingdom of God if you're truly, truly born again by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I can dance for Jesus. I can say amen and hallelujah because we are the children of the King. Our Lord and Master is our true Savior. The only one, the only way in truth that we can come to Him and say, yes, I'm a child of God. I know whose name I bear and whose child I am. And I can stand up for truth in a world where there is a dividing line where we must establish that we must walk from this world, the world that is full of lies and deceit and untruth and ungodliness and everything else you can imagine and cross the dividing line and come to the other side regenerated with a new heart, a life that is pleasing to God that says, yes, I am saved by the goodness of Jesus Christ, by God's goodness, by the grace that he established at the crossroads of life and death, where we can make by the power of life and death is in the tongue, the Old Testament Psalm says, that we, by confessing Christ as Lord and Savior, realizing we're sinners, we can cross over the dividing line that says, there is this world, a world that we are born in, the natural man and woman. And we can make a decision when we come to the age of accountability, like these children here. One day, they will be given the gospel, even today maybe, these children, or anybody here, no matter what age we are. They're going to come to a point in their life where they're going to realize that they've done bad things. And they've hurt, dishonored mom and dad, or whatever they stole something, or lied, whatever it may be. It's a commandment that God says, that are the Ten Commandments. And they're going to make that decision to cross that dividing line and say, you know, I'm going to believe in Jesus. He paid the price for my sin so I can live my life pleasing to God and I can live a life by the guidance of the Holy Ghost in my life. Hallelujah. I want to dance for Jesus. I want to say thank you, Lord. Amen and hallelujah. And I can walk that pathway of faith because there's a dividing line from this kingdom and God's kingdom. And when we stand on the truth, stand on it, and as the parable of this tares explained, he says there to you, Jesus took them, when he went, sent the multitudes away and explained to his disciples, the true followers, why he spoke and is what this was about. The difference between the evil and why it exists. And the fact that there will be at the very end a separation of the tares from the wheat, from the goats and the sheep. Notice in there he talks about that, that the same time when he sowed into that the wheat, the enemy, the devil, comes along and sows into that same field. What does that mean? That means, brothers and sisters, that among those people who are in the church, there are tares among the weeds. There are goats among the sheep. People who pretend that they're Christians because so they were a child, they were raised in a church, they go to church because it's the thing to do because they're used to this religious, ritualistic system that they had been indoctrinated since they were a child. 
But does that mean you have a true born-again relationship with Jesus Christ? Does that mean you've crossed a dividing line that says, I want to serve Him and Him alone, Jesus Christ? That's a question that you have to answer, brothers and sisters, friends and families and whoever. It's a time that we take God serious in a world that doesn't have a clue of what's going on. And we see it in the news, we see it around us. The sadness that the devil has lied and deceived so many, believing the lies that there is no God, that God is dead. Well, the God that I serve that's in this word of God says he's alive. He is risen from the grave. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Right, Brother Claude? Because he lives, I know who, who I serve. I've crossed the dividing line. I've said in my life, and I've realized that, you know, I was talking to the, the assistant, the sheriff department gentleman, Tim, yesterday, and his wife, and, and I was telling him, I'm thinking about, and I, I, I don't believe in coincidence, but I believe, you know, and he was the man to contact of all places when he came to the VBS pre-registration uh, about a, a, a a, a way to attack and take on the drug problems and the people who are facing these addictions and things, a task force to develop something through the churches, community, connecting with police, state police, judges, whoever. And I was talking with him and I said, you know, there is, a, there is a dividing line that these people who are addicted to heroin and, and who, who have They've established themselves in the kingdom where they can't deal with the emptiness and the void in their heart. There's something missing, whether there was something in their past or some influence of the world that draw them to find something to try to find peace in their lives and in their hearts. A void and emptiness. I was there when I was 14 years old, filling it with all kinds of drugs and illegal things, trying to resolve something that was in my heart, a heart that was empty. Because my dad wasn't there when I grew up, many times. So where did I go get the love? I got it in a bottle, I got it in Valium, LSD, marijuana, you name it, took it. 14 years old, taking six Valium in a bottle of wine. I turned pretty white, I think anybody would probably turn pretty white, don't you think? But it continued on because there was something missing, a void. And that's why when we come to the fact that this isn't about religion, brothers and sisters, this is about Jesus Christ who made it personal for every one of us. We've got churches around the world that are preaching what itchy ears want to hear. And they're not preaching about the fact that we are going to separate, that Jesus is going to send his angels and they're going to have a harvest and they're going to wrap up them tares who think they're churchy, who think they've been saved, but they're not. And they're going to burn in the fire. Matthew 7 says, but Lord, Lord, but we did this for you. We did that for you. And Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. In a way, with gnashing of teeth, forever in hell where the fire never quenches. Well, and sisters, we've got to re come to the reality that this is what the gospel is about. The fact that we're sinners, the fact that there is a dividing line between this kingdom and the kingdom of God. And even within the churches, again, we've got to realize I don't know anybody's heart. I don't know your heart. I don't know what your thoughts are, what your heart's about, what your priority is in your life, and who is Lord of your life. But I know mine. I made a decision over 16 years ago that said, I will die to myself. I will die to this kingdom. And I will come alive in Christ. Crossing that dividing line that says, I'm not turning back. Like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, about the blue pill or the red pill in the movie The Matrix, right? Keena Reeves, you know, uh, Neil, he had to make a choice. I'm going to stay in this matrix world, a world that is just, it's, it's, it's fake, it's counterfeit. Or will I go into the reality of the world? And once he took that pill, it's not going back. You're never turning back. What's the song we sing? No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. And that's so important. We've got to make that decision. It's a decision we make, brothers and sisters. It's something that we take seriously. Not something we just say, okay, well, mom and dad told me to come forward as a little boy. And, and yeah, and I, I said, okay, that's great. And I, I, I listened to them and I got supposedly, supposedly saved. And supposedly, I, I, oh, I better get baptized because that's the thing to do. Following the crowds. It's not about following the crowd, brothers and sisters. This is something that we must take seriously. Something that says if God is drawing you and he's drawing you to, to his heart and he wants to give you a new life, he wants to create a new thing in you, a new thing, new wine it talks about. You can't put new wine in old wineskins where it bursts and breaks. 
because the old wineskin typically and metaphorically is talking about the physical bodies, the, the flesh, the natural man or woman. We have to become anew, born again by the Holy Spirit of God, regenerating to newness of life, crossing over the divining line into the kingdom of God where, hallelujah, I can dance for Jesus. I can say I'm a saved sinner by grace. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Hallelujah, I can rise up and keep my head high and say, I know that I have eternal life because I have crossed the line through the crossroads and made a decision, I will follow Jesus. The dividing line is there, folks. The kingdom difference between good and evil. There is both good and evil in this world. In the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 13, 24. He says he sows in the same field. The devil sows in the same field as the Lord. The bad and sown among the good. The devil's method is though is counterfeit and imitation. Just like we see in many of these charismatic movements and certain types of denominations where they've got all these counterfeit so-called signs and miracles and this, you know, crazy evidence of shaking and violently doing crazy things in the church. That is not of God. That's of the devil. That's a kundalini spirit. It's a lie. It's counterfeit. It's imitation. You know, I don't like the imitation vanilla. I want the real vanilla extract when I make my pancakes, my French toast. Put that good vanilla in there. I don't want the imitation. And I don't want to be an imitator of an imitation Christian. I want to be the real deal. I want to wake up and say, get on my knees and say, Lord Jesus, thank you, God. You've given me another day. You give me another day that I can praise you. You give me another day that I can be used for your glory. That I can maybe touch somebody somewhere by the witness of the truth that's in me. Not living a lie, but living for Jesus. I love this song, living for Jesus. A life that is true. It makes sense, brothers and sisters. How about you? I'm a poet and I don't know it. In 2 Corinthians, PowerPoint, 11, verse 13, talking about many evil and false prophets that are in the world, and Apostle Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, you know how many times people today, I'm amazed because, now uh, don't get me wrong, I think they're so-called, God can call anybody he wants, but so-called apostles. You go on Facebook and say, oh, my apostle James or apostle, they're calling themselves apostles today. And, I, and you know, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I don't know their hearts, I don't know God, but, but you know, I, I, just, I just don't believe in someone calling themselves apostle. I, I just, that's just me, you know, my opinion. I remember in Honduras, they, they would call me because I was planning churches and overseeing these 13 churches and teaching and things in Honduras. And the one leader of this concilio, this group of 30, says, well, I believe uh, Roberto is an um, apostol, you know, apostle. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, just don't, don't call me that. That's, I just want to serve and love Jesus. I, have, I am just a sinner saved by grace, and, and I'll do what I have to do for the Lord. So I'll just go to the mountains. We'll go bring food. Marianne and I will go bring clothes and we'll bring the Bibles. And we'll bring my guitar and we'll sing some Spanish praise songs and hallelujah. And if that's what God wants me to do, then I'll do that. You just call me whatever you want, but just don't call me late for dinner. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, it's it, when God touches your heart, when you get over that dividing line, all that prideful stuff, boy, it's gone. When you come into the kingdom of God, man, you get off your throne, if you know what I'm saying. You get off your throne. And you put God on the throne. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Putting God back on the throne where he belongs. In his kingdom, his domain. In Matthew 13, verses 24 through 25, it says, There's another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the weeds and went his way. You see, Christ sows the righteous, the devil sows the wicked. But the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, he says there, Jesus. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. What is that seed? It's the time we talk about the word of God is the seed, the seed principle. As we sow, and we sow the word. The word gets sown into our hearts. And through that, the watering of it, and, and, and eventually there will be a harvest, a harvest time. Isn't it great to know that our labor is not in vain, amen? That we labor for the Lord. Sometimes we feel, oh, we get overwhelmed and we, the, the VBS and this and that. We've got so much to do and you just... But remember, our war, rewards are great in heaven. In the end, the harvest will be great. 
but today the laborers are few. Come and join the harvest of souls. Come and join into the kingdom of God that says you can be used greatly. God used simple fishermen. God used people who were flunkies, people who were murderers, who were thieves, who were whatever. That failed sometimes in society. But God raised them up to a standard of truth and life. He brought them into the kingdom of God. Jesus spoke to the, all throughout the New Testament about the kingdom, the kingdom of God, and taught those disciples and apostles about the kingdom of God. Today, we must emphasize more the kingdom of God and the dividing line that brings us into the kingdom of God. Second point is God will provide a harvest dividing line. In Matthew 13, verse 30, Jesus said this, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in the bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Wow. I sure don't want to be no tare. I sure don't want to be no goat. That frightens me. It makes me... Whoa, I, I, Lord Jesus, you know, repentance right away. It's like, Lord, I just want to make sure whatever I've done, others are, I want to confess my sin. I want to be delivered from the times I failed you, Lord. I, uh, Lord, I just, you know, sometimes we have to repent almost every day, don't we? Because we've got some bitterness, so we've done something. We shouldn't have done it. We get angry at someone that pulled in front of us or, or whatever it may be, some kind of sin. And we, you know, and if the Holy Spirit's leading us in his kingdom, right away, we're just, whoa, man, I got to stop. What am I doing? Why am I yelling at my wife? Why am I yelling at my dog? What my dog do? Got to stop it, Bob. What are you doing? You know, you just got to drop back and think a minute here. Think kingdom principles. Think that we've crossed the dividing line into the joy of Jesus. And Jesus would, does not want to allow, he doesn't want us to see uh, hatred and pain and stuff. He doesn't want us to to, be, to hurt others. He wants us to love others as Christ loved us. To show them that the true love of the Lord, that agape love, unselfish, total love for others. Does love hurt sometimes? Oh boy, it sure does, doesn't it? Sometimes when we get to tell a child, you know, son, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, but I've got to discipline you. I've got to get you right. Because you're disobeying mom and dad. You're not listening to what I'm telling you. And mom and dad sometimes are trying to teach children a lesson. Our Father God in heaven wants to teach us a lesson too sometimes. That when we fail, we can come to him. And we can ask for forgiveness. Because forgiveness is available. It's available today. It's available for all of us in every way. Matthew 3, 12, finally, talking more about the fact that there is a hell. And that those who are denying Christ and those who are goats and tares that will be burned in the, in the fire of hell. Matthew 3.12 His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn those are those who are true children of God in a relationship but he will also burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable. You know firemen they deal with many fires and they have to know different fire extinguishers they have to know how to put out fire, just like a grease fire. You don't put water on a grease fire. How many women have learned that maybe sometime in their lives? You try to put a fire up with water, and all of a sudden you just grease it. It just spreads everywhere. You know, it's very, you got to understand that. Try to put out a fire. But the fire of hell, the Word of God says here, Jesus said, is unquenchable. But it's just, I don't know about you, but that puts the fear of God in me. Puts the fear of God in me. That I will do what I'm called to do. We all have a calling in our lives. We all have gifts, talents. We must let the light shine of Christ. Let the living water flow through us. Let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, hallelujah, I like that. Let the little light of Jesus shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. God alone has the wisdom to judge correctly. I'm not judging you, and I will never judge you. That's God's, God's and Jesus Christ. All judgment has been given to the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And we will all face that day. The question is, will you face Him 
And will he say, I know you? And will he say, well done? Or will he say, I don't know who you are? If you're not sure today, if Jesus knows you, I suggest you make a decision. Make a decision to say, Lord, I repent. Today, make the decision you want to cross that dividing line from this world to God's kingdom. You must be born again. Today, what will you be identified as? Wheat or a tear? Sheep or a goat? As Fox News says, I report, you decide.